So Lord, everybody, it is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock uh, Central Standard Time. We greet you this evening from the Huntsville, Alabama area in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a brand new work that has recently come to this area from Dallas, Texas. We have changed our name to reflect our new location, although it is certainly the same ministry that you have been familiar with now for many, many years. Um, we were in Dallas for many years, over two decades, and we're utilizing the name, The One Church in Christ Jesus. However, now we are employing the name Forward Christian Life Center. Amen. In Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we invite you to check out our website at www.forwardclc, all one word, dot com. Forwardclc.com. We have been studying uh, an ongoing series that I've simply titled LGBT Affirming Theology. We're looking at uh, LGBT issues as they are presented or as they have been misrepresented in the Word of God. And uh, we're examining them afresh. We're looking not only at passages, but we're looking at the entire framework of theology within the Christian faith as it relates to LGBT people. Uh, we're going to be moving this week into the New Testament, finally, some might say, and uh, but we're moving into the New Testament, and uh, we're actually going to be examining, beginning today, uh, Romans chapter 1, and uh, I believe there is going to be a... Uh, great amount of information that will be a blessing to uh, any and all believers who will join us for this study. This is not simply a matter of uh, interest to the LGBT community, as I've said before. Understanding uh, Scripture in truth is beneficial to all. While there may be certain passages that have been misused and misapplied as they relate to certain groups of people, um, the reality is that as you understand it in truth, uh, all of a sudden there are truths within those passages that apply to us all. And uh, so I think you'll find this very beneficial and very much a blessing. Before we go into our study this evening, I'd like us to open with a word of prayer. Master, we love you, God. We thank you. We count it a privilege and an honor and a joy to explore the Word of God. And tonight, oh God, as always, I ask that the anointing and the power and presence of the Holy Ghost would rest upon us. Lord, we are discussing issues which for centuries have been misrepresented and misapplied. So many souls have been wounded and injured and destroyed by the misuse of these passages. And if those, Lord, today who stand to benefit from an understanding of this truth, if they are to receive the word of God with gladness, if they are to receive the truth that we are about to expound upon, it is going to require the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. So many wounds, Lord, leave bruises and leave scabs that make it difficult for us to hear and receive uh, truth. 
But tonight, oh God, I ask that the healing salve, which is the presence of God, would flow from this place. Touch every heart, every mind. Allow us, Lord, today to have a heart that is cultivated. Let the stony ground be broken up today that it might receive the seed of God's word. Lord, that that seed might spring forth and ultimately bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. Save those that are lost. Reclaim the backslider. Send forth your word right now to reconcile, to heal, to deliver, and to save. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, it's funny, the Word of God gives a clarion warning that we have all heard at some point in our Christian experience, and yet it's only been in recent decades that I've begun to understand this passage in a way that I had never understood it before. In Isaiah 5, verses 20 and 21, uh, Isaiah the prophet is saying, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. It's only been in recent decades as I began to explore uh, LGBT theology, uh, Christian theology as it relates to LGBT people and LGBT issues. It's only as I began to dig into and dive into these subjects that I began to realize that for many years, uh, many within the Christian church we're calling good, decent people evil, calling good, decent people wicked, trying to label uh, folks who are nothing more than human as if they were the worst possible uh, evil entity on planet Earth. And tonight, we're going to clear some of that mess up for you, okay? In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, and we're going to begin down here at verse number 18. The Word of God today reads in Romans 1, beginning at verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I want to point out to you, this is all written in the past tense, when they knew God. They glorified, past tense, him not as God, neither were, past tense, thankful. Okay? So you have to understand, Paul is obviously writing about somebody who existed and somebody who did these things he's writing about. But these people existed prior to Paul's writing. So let's continue. 
when they knew God, they glorified him. <clears throat> Not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Obviously now it's clear, doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand, that Paul is talking here very clearly about idolatrous people, okay? Uh, he's saying that they had the opportunity to know God, that God had revealed himself and made himself plainly known, um, unlike the mysteries that surrounded him in uh, eons past. He had made himself known. Of course, we understand as believers, he did this through the life of, of the Lord Jesus Christ through the presence in this world of the man Jesus Christ. He said they knew God, but they glorified him not as God. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was walking the earth, and these people of whom Paul is writing uh, did not recognize him as God, didn't appreciate him as God, but instead they uh, changed the glory of of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things, which again we know many of the false gods, the idols of ancient times were designed after men, the images of men or the images of animals or four-footed beasts so on and so forth, or sometimes they would combine uh, elements from different animals, you know, in order to create the image of uh, a certain God. We also understand that during the time of the Caesars and during the time of Herod's reign in Israel, that Pilate brought in images, graven images of Caesar into Israel specifically with the intent of trying to stir up uh, trouble. He, he, this guy was trying to force the Jewish people into compromising their faith. And when they would not compromise, and it appeared as though they might actually wind up uh, rebelling and there could potentially be a war, an insurrection, uh, all of a sudden he changed course and removed these images. So Paul is writing about things that he has seen, he has witnessed, he has observed, and about people who existed uh, before the writing of this epistle. Now, you also have to understand Paul is writing to the church at Rome. The church at Rome consisted of believers who were both Jewish as well as believers who were Gentile, okay? But he is writing to the church at Rome. Rome is the seat of government. It is the place uh, where Caesar lives. It is the place uh, that it is the... Um, kingdom that has occupied and conquered uh, the land of Israel. And so uh, you need to bear in mind the context. Who is Paul writing to? As you understand who Paul's writing to, you begin to better understand who Paul is writing about. In writing to the Romans, he is writing about the Romans, okay? Uh, the Romans occupied, and still occupied at the time of this writing, the land of Israel. Therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ was walking planet Earth, and God was being revealed to humanity, the Romans had full exposure 
to him. They were fully exposed to him. They had the opportunity to see and to witness everything that the Jewish people saw and witnessed. And yet for all this, they did not recognize him, obviously, as God. And Paul continues to write and talk about, but instead they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, verse 24, wherefore, so Paul is saying, because they did this, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. They worshiped Caesar. They viewed Caesar as a deity. They worshiped and served the creature, that which is created, the human being, more than the Creator. <coughs> Verse 26, for this cause, again, again, look at the language, Paul is saying, and for this reason. So what he's about to say is specifically tied to the fact that these people did these things. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like, again, we're talking past tense, even as they did not like To retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Most evangelical Christians have convinced themselves that LGBT people are afraid of the Bible or have rewritten it in an effort to, quote, justify their orientations. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, here I would like to address one of the most common New Testament passages that is used to condemn all gay, lesbian, transgendered people. It's my hope that by the time we finished uh, this examination of this passage, you'll be able to clearly see all the lies that are told about the LGBT community within our human family, all in the name of God. 
The following passage that I, or the passage I've just read to you is most frequently used to condemn in wholesale fashion LGBT people. Now we've talked about this in the past. It is a crime to read any passage of scripture without taking into account the context in which the text was written. Every Hebrew uh, Jewish rabbi knows this. Very few Christian ministers, on the other hand, uh, tend to take this into account. They prefer to believe that the writings of the Bible stand alone and have absolutely no connection or any foundation uh, related to the circumstances surrounding the writing of any given passage. That is not true. The Roman armies had conquered the land of Israel. The people of God were subject to the Roman authorities. It was the Roman government whom the Jewish leaders insisted crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Apostle Paul wrote the newly established church in the city of Rome, he began by pointing out the fact that the Romans were so blind and ignorant spiritually that they did not see Jesus Christ as more than just a man. They did not recognize him as the very God of creation himself manifested in human form. That's why we read, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The term Godhead meaning all that pertains to God, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew past tense God, they glorified past tense him not as God, neither were past tense thankful, but became past tense vain, in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was, past tense, darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed, past tense, the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Thinking they were wise, they were foolish and blind, not seeing that the very God, the very person and image of God, had been manifested before them. Paul then goes on to say, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. In other words, Paul is saying, for this reason God gave the Romans up to their own vile perversions and idolatry. He allowed them to fully invest and fully immerse themselves in this humanist uh, 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 image-worshipping idolatry, which included the worship of the male and the male anatomy. That gets into the uh, phallic religions of ancient times. We know that the idea of sexual immorality and idolatry were married to one another in ancient times, as Paul's statement clearly also joins these two items together. He's bringing together the notion of idolatry and 
rampant sexual immorality or rampant uh, immoral sexual conduct. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So he's talking clearly about idolatry. Worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. The Roman people were part of a political and religious system which worshipped their sovereign, their king, Caesar, as God. They magnified a man above the place of the creator God. And then when the creator himself appeared upon the earth, remember John the apostle said, <clears throat> he was in the world and he created the world and the world knew him not. When God himself appeared upon the earth, they did not see him for who he was, but rather saw him only as a mere man. Part of the Roman glorification of man was demonstrated in their devotion to phallic religions, which literally viewed the male genitalia as something divine. It was the source of life, according to these ancient religious belief systems. They were so wrapped up in the idea that humanity was capable of procreation, particularly as it related to the male's ability to sow the seed of life within the female womb, that they looked upon sex as something of a spiritual transaction. Sex was used as a means of pleasure, as well as a method of punishment, humiliation, and an expression of worship. For this reason, Paul writes, the Roman people had to literally set aside their natural sexual appetites in order to engage in sexual activities which served these purposes. In ancient times, when an army would win a battle, it, it was not uncommon, and frankly, we've heard of these things in modern times. It was not uncommon for uh, the winning army to sexually humiliate uh, and defile the beaten army, especially their high-ranking officials, whether it be the king, whether it be generals, uh, they would sexually humiliate these men by raping them. And so, therefore, this had nothing to do with being homosexual. This had to do with... Um, being so perverse in your ideology and in your theology and believing the male genitalia to be the source of all creation and the source of power and by uh, forcing a male to be subjected to you, you were in effect making a woman out of them, which if even in modern times... Uh, uh, nowadays, we're trying to get away from this more and more, but it used to be, I know when I was a kid, if you wanted to humiliate a boy, you know, all you had to do was tell him that he was acting like a girl, behaving like, oh, you're being a little girl. You're acting like a little girl. Now, like I've said, thankfully, we're getting away from that practice, or at least we're trying to do that because we understand now that in doing so, it's not by the only way you're putting down the boy is by first assuming that a girl is less, you know, that she is less than somehow. And therefore, uh, the accusation, you're being like a girl, you're acting like a girl, humiliates the boy. But this is why they would do these things. And in order to do these things, they had to ignore their natural sexual appetites, and they would have to find a way to kind of get around that, okay? There'd have, you'd have to find a way 
to get around your natural inclinations in order to do something that was not natural to you. A soldier finding an enemy king or high-ranking official would often rape, sodomize is a term we're familiar with, even though that implies a false understanding of Sodom, and we've been through that in our previous studies. But uh, they would often rape that king or that <clears throat> high-ranking individual as a means of humiliating he and his armies and demoralizing the conquered peoples. This action obviously had nothing to do with sexual appetites or orientations, but rather it was born of a sheer desire to humiliate and embarrass their conquered foe. Paul goes on to state in verses 26 and 27, For this cause... So it's because they would literally ignore their natural inclinations. They would ignore their, uh, their natural orientation in order to do something that had absolutely no connection to their natural desires or uh, inclinations whatsoever. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women, so he's saying now the men would do this. They would humiliate and they would use sex as a weapon and use sex as a punishment and use sex as torture. He said, but even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So according to the Apostle Paul, the women changed the natural use. To change implies and means that they actively did something in order to exchange what was natural for them to something that was not natural for them. Not every gay person, my friend, got news for you. Woke up one morning and said, I think I'll change. I don't think I want to be heterosexual anymore. I think I'll change my appetites. I think I'll change my uh, affections. No, that's, that's not what happened. But because of their idolatry, because of their rampant embrace of sexuality as a form of worship, as a form of torture, as a form of um, punishment. God allowed them to be overwhelmed by an unnatural affection for them. He allowed them to be overcome by a desire to do those things that they had given themselves over to do. Goes on to say, the, one, the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, listen, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now Paul speaks clearly of the fact that the Romans were so vile and perverted in their sexual appetites that they chose to exchange their natural sexual orientations to engage in homosexual activity, or at least bisexual activity, which was not at all natural to them. Preachers today do not differentiate between those who may have a natural for them orientation. That is, gay, lesbian people versus one 
who purposely engages in homosexual activity in an effort to satisfy their ever-reaching sexual desires. Now, I personally know of very few gay, lesbian people who identify as homosexual because they are motivated only by the sexual act associated with homosexuality. Most gay, lesbian people are attracted to members of their same gender for reasons which go far beyond the sexual aspect and include such factors as an emotional and relational attraction. The vast majority of gay, lesbian people are in fact very much relationship-oriented. They're not simply seeking sexual gratification, but rather a relationship within the parameters of their gay, lesbian orientation. If you were to research the many dating and single sites on the internet today for gay, lesbian people, you'd find that the majority of participants on these sites clearly state that they are seeking a relationship and not merely sex. For many, many centuries, LGBT people were relegated to only being able to experience brief uh, moments of intimacy because there was a huge gamble. It was a huge risk for them uh, to try to venture into a meaningful, lasting relationship. The minute that they began to enter into any kind of relationship, it made their uh, the likelihood of their being found out and their being outed much greater, which meant uh, right up until the, the this last century meant they could lose their jobs, they could lose their professional licenses. Um, you could lose a license as a teacher, you could lose a license as a lawyer, you could lose a medical license, all because you were found out to be homosexual, which is insane, because what on earth does one's sexual orientation have to do with any of these professions? But that's beside the point. So while there are some, I know, in the, in the uh, evangelical world who immediately are going to try to suggest that what I've just said is untrue, you know, look at Grindr, look at all these... Um, uh, websites and blah, 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 that, you know, are really just for people who are out there hunting sex, you know. Uh, well, first of all, all of these sites uh, have their straight equivalents, okay? Uh, there are plenty of heterosexual sites. Uh, there's far more heterosexual pornography out there in the world today than there is homosexual pornography. Uh, so don't act like this is somehow a homosexual problem, you know, or a homosexual issue. Certainly there are people in the gay community who are uh, hypersexual, who are uh, uh, sex addicted. We live in a society that is obsessed with sex. Everything that is sold to us today from uh, laptops to candy bars are sold with sex. So yes, of course, uh, it is true that there are many people out there who, for whatever reason, and as I've said before, many people do many different things for many different reasons. So you cannot simply apply, oh, they're just obsessed. They're just full of lust. That's why they do it. No, that may not at all be why they do it. And suggesting that that one cure-all answer applies to everybody is the epitome of ignorance. But the reality is, I know years ago, before the internet, I used to read through the Village Voice and different publications that would have personal ads. And it always amazed me how many of those ads would say, a long-term relationship-oriented, relationship-oriented, seeking an LTR, you know. 
Um, as our society has grown more understanding and more sympathetic and more accepting of LGBT people, at least it was until Trump, uh, who opened the doors wide open for the evangelical community and their convoluted doctrine to jump all over LGBT people all over again. But prior to that, as our society appeared to be moving in a very positive direction, LGBT people were uh, much more able to openly, this is why more and more people are coming out, has nothing to do with, you know, we're making more gay people, you know, we're doing a better job of recruiting. Personally, I've been out since 1989, and I've never recruited a single soul. I'm not the least been interested in recruiting anybody uh, to the LGBT uh, orientation. As a matter of fact, anybody who knows me knows when I counsel young people who come to me and they feel as though they may be possibly, uh, I, they may identify possibly as LGBT, um, I do not get on either side of the equation ever. My position is we love you, we support you. This is something you're going to have to uh, find out for yourself. This is not something I can advise you on. Um, this is very personal. There are people who uh, will go through phases, as it were, and uh, they may question, they may wonder, they may exper experiment, but ultimately they find that they are, in fact, uh, either heterosexual or perhaps merely bisexual, and they come to understand their bisexuality. Uh, but I do not get on, you know, the LGBT side and start pulling on the rope trying to get them over to our side. No, um, that why? What, what, you know, what benefit would there be for me or for our community as a whole to do this, especially if you pull somebody over, as it were, and then later they determine that, in fact, uh, they're merely bi, or perhaps they determine uh, that they were going through a, a time of experimentation and discovery, and they're not, you know, gay or lesbian. By doing that, all you're doing is creating this whole illusion again that LGBT orientation is strictly a matter of choice. So no, I, you know, I don't do that. Um, many datings and single sites uh, are full of ads which say they're people are seeking a relationship and not merely sexual experiences. The fact, or excuse me, the same used to be true of print publications, as I've just mentioned, which uh, offered personal ads for gay, lesbian people. The fact that the majority of perverse, pornographic, sex-only websites in the world today are heterosexual in nature goes ignored by the religious right. They don't care what someone does within the context of heterosexual conduct, just so long as it is not uh, homosexual. Where the problems arise is when an individual has uh, what is for them a natural, innate, internal attraction to and interest in members of the same sex. The truth of the matter is, most of Christendom has actually become much like the perverse Roman Empire in that they practically worship the male-female ability to procreate. So you see, like I've said, I said a lot of you non-LGBT folks can benefit from this study. What we're actually finding, if you look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church very much walked back into 
the pattern of the old Babylonian religion, which was phallic-based. And it was all about procreation. Why do you think the Roman Catholic Church for so long was against uh, um, birth control? Why do you think that the Roman Catholic Church took such a strong stance against abortion? Because they've come to the place where they virtually worship the human ability to procreate. I've talked about in this Bible study what the Bible says the purpose was for God creating Eve, for Adam. And yet, the Christian church, the fundamentalist and evangelical church, as well as most others, always approach it as though it was an issue of procreation. They always approach marriage as though it's all about legitimizing sex and providing for the opportunity to procreate as though somehow that is a divine directive. No, in the beginning it was a divine directive because obviously in the beginning uh, were Adam and Eve not to procreate, the human race would have died in a matter of a couple of generations. So, yes, what was true then was true then. Is that same mandate and directive as true today? No. We know the world is virtually overpopulated as it is. We know there are nations around the world that have far more people than they can feed and care for. So, uh, just because something was the standard at one time does not mean that that standard remains true forever. We don't see Jesus anywhere. When he talks about marriage, he talks about a man uh, leaving his father and mother and cleaving unto his wife. He doesn't say one word about it. Now, at that point, they are to uh, be fruitful and multiply. No, he doesn't bring the procreation aspect at all into the equation. It was simply about two people coming together and effectively becoming one. So, while much of Christianity today has become much like the perverse Roman Empire in that they virtually worship the, the male-female ability to procreate, they've made this function the center of all civilization and the foundation of the church. Little is said of those who cannot, for one reason or another, actually produce offspring, whether it be barren women, sterile men, older couples. Are they less important in the church? or less vital to the stability of our society and civilization because they cannot produce offspring? Of course not. But when we recognize that the sexual act and the ability to procreate has nothing to do with God's original plan for humanity, but rather, listen carefully now, is a response to our fall. It is the fall that necessitated procreation. Prior to the fall, procreation was effectively a non-issue. Adam and Eve were designed to live forever. The Lord said, In the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Prior to that, they were designed to live forever. What then was the great need at that time for procreation? There was none. But after the fall, as humanity became acquainted with death, it became necessary that we procreate in order for the race to live on. We must validate all human relationships, sexual or otherwise, as being the actual primary building block of society 
culture, and civilization. See, a lot of churches, they like to represent this notion, family is the foundation of society. Family is the foundation of the church. Hallelujah, glory to God. There is no family without first a couple. No such thing as family. Not, not, uh, not in any sense of the word can you have family without two people first joining themselves, marrying themselves, uniting themselves together. Okay, so while it's all well and good, you know, family is the foundation. Well, well, no, that's ridiculous because that ignores the fact that there is something that is essential yet to family, and that is the couple. Okay, so we have to understand that it's humanity's ability to make a choice and a commitment to one singular mate, whatever their gender, that makes us unique and powerful. A cord of th three strands or more cannot be created unless a cord of two strands has first been established. So the truth is, Couples are the foundation of our society and civilization, and their ability or inability to procreate has nothing to do with their value to society. Adam was, in effect, incomplete. God created Eve specifically as a helper and a companion for him. He did not create Eve. For the purpose of procreation. Procreation was unnecessary in the face of eternal life. Adam and Eve were originally created to live forever in the Garden of Eden. They were not to go outside of the Garden of Eden. Had they started procreating within a few generations, they would have overcrowded the garden, which was a very limited, specific area. They had to have uh, access to the garden. They were placed there to tend it and to take care of it. Um... It did not become necessary that they procreate until they had disobeyed the mandate of the Lord and were demoted in nature to that place where death became a reality for them. No record is found in the Word of God of Adam and Eve having any offspring until after they were ejected from the Garden of Eden. At that moment, procreation was absolutely necessary. Prior to the fall, these two were for each other exactly what God had created them to be. Helpers, companions, supports. When phallic religions celebrated man's ability to procreate, listen carefully, they were in effect spinning in the face of God's death sentence and saying, see, we can continue anyway, even in the face of death. Are there people in our world who are so perverse that they're willing to set aside their natural sexual orientation in order to pursue the, quote, forbidden realms of same-sex activity? Of course there are. We see it happen all the time in prisons and in same-sex settings where men are forced to live only in the company of other men and women are forced to live only in the company of other women. During the Roman era, men most often kept company with other men 
Women were not as highly valued in that society, so they were frequently forced to spend the vast majority of their time with other women. It is not hard to see how a society that was so gender segregated could wind up seeing same-sex sexuality blossom, even though it was not the direct byproduct of a homosexual orientation. When one would get sexually stimulated, whoever was closest to, to them became a, a potential partner in sensuous activity. At least that was the thinking of the Roman people. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. Paul makes clear the Romans were not given to acknowledge God in their thinking. They lived their lives as though there were no judgment to be faced and no account to be given. Rules meant nothing to them as they believed that they alone answered to themselves. Again, you have to bear in mind, this is why the Jewish people were unique in the world. God had given them the law. They were like the only child in a school whose parents actually had rules and uh, mandates that child had to follow and all the rest of the kids just ran loose and did whatever they pleased, whenever they pleased, however they pleased, with whomever they pleased. And you have this one kid that has boundaries and has rules. And this is why, as we were talking about the law in previous sessions, this is why in the New Testament, the New Testament writers were so taken aback as Gentile believers began to come into the church because they had never been exposed to people who were uh, raised without rules and without boundaries. And so this is why they spent so much time talking about uh, issues of morality and decency and right behavior and right conduct uh, because they were dealing with people who, unlike themselves, had never been exposed to the law or rules and boundaries, okay? So, many humanist thinkers exist in our world today who also embrace this type of thinking. They've concluded that there is no God, and therefore they may conduct themselves however they please. One need not be homosexual to have this mindset. In fact, some of the most perverted and decadent human beings that I've ever known in my life have been homo uh, heterosexuals. Uh, I have heterosexual members of my own family, who at one time were swingers. They were wife swappers in my own family. I did some research on swinging in the United States, and they estimate that there are, are probably in excess of 11 million swingers in America. That's quite a number. Um, these are people who literally go out and swap out partners with other couples, okay? Uh, and then I worked in the car sales business for a number of years. And uh, I worked with men. Man, I'm telling you, you want to talk about perverted and dirty and disgusting. I can't even talk. I literally cannot even venture near what some of the men I used to work with would say about female customers that came into the store and stuff like that. Um, car sales is a notoriously stressful profession. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but I'll tell you what, 
Um, I worked with guys who were so perverted and so sick, it wasn't even funny. And yet, they were very much heterosexual. In verse 29, Paul writes, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Um, sorry, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Paul went down a list of related behaviors which accompanied the sexual, mis uh, the sexual misconduct of the Romans. This list can easily be seen as not at all being specific to or descriptive of gay lesbian people. In fact, many of the items on this list are also mentioned by Paul in his second letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8, Paul wrote, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. That's heterosexual, folks. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Notice how convenient it is for the church to ignore the blatant similarities between Paul's writings to the Roman church and his letter to Timothy, his second epistle to Timothy, in which he spells out the decay that is to occur within the church in the last days. Interestingly, it's the church that is described as becoming more and more like pagan Rome. The glorification and virtual worship of the reproductive process that goes on in the church can clearly be seen today. Paul's use of the term reprobate in both our primary text, Romans 1.28, and his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and 8, is generally applied to one who has known the truth, but who has chosen to walk away from it. The Romans once had a fear of God and possessed some knowledge of his existence, but during the time of the early church, they had already begun to devolve, and they no longer embraced such thoughts. Instead, acting as though God were non-existent, and judgment was a ridiculous notion. Look again at the list of attributes offered by Paul relative to these ungodly Romans. He said they were filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, which we understand to speak of abusive, manipulative, objectifying cross-species, 
or hurtful sexual conduct. This includes incest, rape, prostitution, bestiality, molestation, and religious ritual sex. He also includes in his list wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. The list offered by Paul in Romans chapter 1 describes the people who are nothing at all similar to the LGBT population. Christians today act as though these things are seldom found within the mainstream heterosexual population, in spite of the fact we know this not to be true. It's a known fact to many police forces, for instance, that gay lesbian people are less violent and less likely to enter into violent exchanges than are their testosterone-pumping heterosexual counterparts. I've personally been in a number of gay bars and clubs in my life. Well, I was out of church. I don't make a habit of it these days. I've seen very, very, very few arguments or fights in LGBT establishments. And God is my witness. That's a fact. Yet, when my heterosexual brother asked me to accompany him again while I was out of church to straight bars and clubs, there was not one night, not one time, that I did not bear witness to some violence or physical altercation. I've even had a number of men come after me because I spoke to, smiled at, or stood next to their girlfriends. I was no more interested in their girlfriends than I was setting myself on fire. And yet, I had guys who literally tried to start something with me, okay? So, in the state of Texas, my mother was a police officer in the state of Texas for a number of years, and she shared this with me. She said, in the state of Texas, they continually train their police officers through an online system of courses. She said that uh, in this state, the curriculum which is used to train officers relative to sexual and violent crimes uh, in their literature, it is clearly pointed out to these police officers that the vast majority of sexual crimes are committed by heterosexuals. They point to the fact that even when a man molests a male child, it is primarily an issue of manipulation and control, not in response to his sexual orientation. That man who does the molesting oftentimes will be heterosexual, but he derives some twisted sense of satisfaction from manipulating and controlling a child. Most children in their prepubescent state are very much alike anyway, so the physical aspect of the rape or incest is really moot in the abuser's mind. The truth today is this. The majority of psychiatric organizations long ago recognized that homosexuality was a natural, innate orientation that had nothing to do with a, quote, lifestyle choice, end quote. Most law enforcement, medical, and psychiatric organizations in our society today know all too well 
that the vast majority of stereotypes perpetrated against gay, lesbian, and transgender people are completely false and utterly erroneous. Religious leaders choose, you want to talk about choice, they choose to continue stirring up the Christian community with proven lies and untruths. Yeah, they're the ones who are making a conscious effort to perpetrate lies and stereotypes in the face of glaring facts. As Paul was writing the book of Romans, the people and civilization of Rome were in steady moral and spiritual decline. All the evils described by Paul were present in that, soci in that society. Perversion and sensuality for sheer pleasure's sake were common in that culture. To say Paul was trying to describe or label the entire quote-unquote homosexual community is a gross misrepresentation. His comments had nothing to do with anyone having a natural innate sexual orientation. His commentary related specifically to those who had purposely, consciously exchanged what was natural for them for something that was not natural for them. You know, it always, it, it never ceases to amaze me how someone can come out to their family or to their friends and that person will turn around and say to them, well, you know, I always kind of knew it. I had, I had family members said this to me. Oh, well, you know, I knew it ever since you were a kid. I knew ever since you were a kid. Really? You knew ever since I was a kid that according to evangelicals and fundamentalists, I was going to choose this orientation. I was going to choose this so-called lifestyle. You knew that ever since I was a kid. I have a dear lady. I love her immensely. Grew up with her in church. I think she's one of the sweetest, kindest um, Christian ladies I've ever known in my life. Love her to death. She has a daughter who is uh, a lesbian. And she and I were talking. Of course, this is after I had come out and was engaged in LGBT affirming ministry for many years. And uh, I, I went to Connecticut. I was visiting with she and her daughters, who were friends of mine since we were kids. And she told me, she said, you know, I knew my daughter was this way as far back as I can remember. She said, I knew it when she was a little, little, little girl. I knew it. Now, how is it? That on one hand, so many people can acknowledge that you can look at a child oftentimes and say, mm, I got a feeling that kid's going to grow up and they'll be LGBT. How is it we can do that? And yet we can still scream and holler accusations and condemnation at that same person when they later come out as though it is strictly a matter of choice that they have embraced this quote-unquote ungodly lifestyle. Obviously, that is not the context in which Paul was writing. Obviously, Paul was not writing about homosexual people, so-called. He was writing specifically about the idolatrous, perverse uh, society of the Roman people, which was infamous. It was known the world over. Uh, not very long before Paul's writing this epistle, Caligula had been the emperor, and he was known to be one of the most vile and disgusting uh, 
sovereigns in the Roman Empire using sex as torture and using it as punishment, using it as entertainment. I mean, for everything but uh, it's any kind of a, a, a natural purpose, certainly not for the sake of uh, interpersonal intimacy. So, religious leaders, they just keep choosing to misrepresent this. They choose to demonize LGBT people. To say Paul was trying to describe the entire LGBT community, is a, it, it's false. It's a complete misrepresentation. His comments had nothing to do with natural uh, sexual orientation. He spoke of people who had purposely, consciously exchanged that which was natural for something that was not natural. Their motivation in doing so was nothing but lust alone. And while they try to suggest that this is what motivates all LGBT people, uh, gay, lesbian people, to be gay or lesbian is lust alone. That is not a fact, and God knows that's not a fact. So I could care less what their opinion is. I could care less how they try to twist and pervert and misrepresent the Word of God in Romans 1, because I know for a fact that is not the case. I knew I was gay before I knew what sex was. I wasn't interested in sex. I could, could have cared less. I didn't even care about kissing at that point. But I still felt this incredible attraction of being drawn to members of the same gender. And I'd get all starry-eyed and I'd develop crushes on people, you know, when I was six, seven, eight years old for the love of people. The Roman people were not at all interested in relation, relationships, excuse me, monogamy, or any kind of godly values. Their sexual pursuits were founded upon sheer lust and sexual abandon. Now the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear I'm almost done with this uh, study tonight. I'm going to have to save the remainder of this for next week. But let me just read this last statement for you. The Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear that the conduct of the Romans was in response to their spiritual idolatry, which in turn gave birth to their godless attitudes and moral abandon. Therefore, if this chapter is addressing the issue of homosexuality, as so many misrepresent in the broadest possible way, then Paul would be saying that all homosexuality is the byproduct of idolatry, lust, moral abandon, and an unwillingness to acknowledge God or to accept the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can't have it both ways, folks. You cannot claim that Romans 1 is about homosexuals and then pick and choose which parts of it apply to LGBT people and which parts don't. No, Romans 1 is about a people who became so engrossed in idolatry that they worshiped the creature, the creation, more than the creator. A people who had been exposed to God to the extent that they could say, that Paul could say, when they knew God, they did not acknowledge him as God. So are you saying that every gay, lesbian person on the planet, every single one, is a former Christian? Because it would have to be so. 
There must not be any gay or lesbian Hindus. There must not be any gay or lesbian Buddhists. There must not be any gay or lesbian uh, Muslims. But we know, of course, there are. The reality is Paul was speaking of a very specific people. And the people he was writing to were the people he was writing about. He was speaking to them of a people they would immediately understand and recognize as the society out of which they had come. Both Jew and Gentile had been part of this society. They had believed and embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul was saying to them, these people had the opportunity. They were there when Jesus Christ walked planet Earth. God manifest in human form. The apostle Paul saying to Timothy, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And as I've said in John chapter 1, the apostle John declares, he was in the world and he created, he created, he created. Not, not they created, he and somebody else. He created the world and the world knew him not. So the reality is Romans 1 was written by Paul to the church at Rome, and he was writing specifically about the idolatrous, uh, immoral, ungodly society that was the Roman society of the first century. All right, folks, I am about out of time. For this session, we will pick up on this next Wednesday night. Uh, if you're available on Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time, 3 o'clock local time in the afternoon, we invite you to come be with us for church. I like to say the way it was meant to be. Amen. Uh, at 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537. That's in the middle building. There are three buildings uh, that constitute the, uh, the complex that we're in right there, close to the mall on Memorial Parkway. And uh, if you go in the center driveway and drive to the back of that building, uh, and look up, you'll see us on the second floor, right down that center drive between the buildings. And uh, we're right there on the right-hand side, and you'll see our sign on the rail. I hope you'll come be with us. That is Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. If, you're not live, if you don't live local, I hope you'll come be with us uh, Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time live on YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, we would look forward to seeing you online. And then, of course, next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, we'll be here with you once again uh, to study the Word of God for our midweek Bible study. Uh, I would like to pray real quick. Master, we love you. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the truth of God, which is able to break down barriers and to destroy the hurts and wounds and bruises and scabs of the enemy. Master, bring the Word which our listeners have heard this evening to life in their spirit. Let it breathe new life into their spiritual being. Let that one who is backslid and away from God find restoration and reconciliation in the name of Jesus. Oh, Master, today, give us a mighty revival. Send us people, Lord, who want to worship you, who want to live for you, who want to pray, who want to seek your face, but who more than anything want to see a mighty move of God in our nation that will help to restore and bring unity and peace back to this great United States of America. Master, in the name of Jesus, keep us 
in your care, for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. My friend, until we see you next time, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.